Welcome to the simplicity of happiness when more is too much. This podcast offers tips and techniques for a better life. And before we start with another episode of the Simplicity of Happiness podcast, I would like to remind you that you can find out all about me and my thoughts on simplicityofhappiness.com as well as Patreon, where I am providing extra content for all of you who support me and the education of children in Africa. And now relax and enjoy the show. Hello and good morning, Utah. Um, hi, hi, Chris. Welcome to the Simplicity of Happiness podcast. I'm excited to talk to you. Yes, yeah, so, so am I. And I just found out the other the other time that we talked that you are actually living in the place to be Ogden. <laughs> it's a fun little ski town. Yeah. I never saw it as a ski town. Um, uh, I, I, I only went there to some some mall for shopping, I, th I think, because I, I used to live in the neighboring um, county in in. Uh, in Leighton, actually, and I went uh, to high school in Clearfield, Northridge High. So uh, you brought me, you brought back my youth. <laughs> yeah, and you probably know better than me, but um, like we we started coming here probably 10 years ago to ski, and it was kind of not a destination place, and you probably have a better insight on that than me, but we just kind of fell in love with it. And it was kind of, most ski towns you go to, they're overrun, and it's so crowded and touristy, and so we kind of fell in love with it, but yeah, it's kind of being discovered. And like, we bought our house here four years ago, and it's about doubled in price. So it's, it's crazy. It's a different place, probably since since you maybe been here, but uh, we, we still love it here. And people said exactly the same in the 90s. Because it was um, the, uh, the Winter Olympic Games were about to happen in Salt Lake. Um, and well Utah was, most of all was an empty place um, but those who lived there very often they moved from California because they said well it's somehow the same climate but you have the mountains um, it's not so overrun it's not so expensive schools are better and no crime um, and the housing market is just going up <laughs> so they are saying this since the 90s I should have bought something back then I guess <laughs> Yeah, you would have probably been doing pretty well right now. Yeah, probably. Um, and uh, right now, as uh, as I told you last time, and as uh, our listeners might know, I'm living most of the time in the Swiss mountains in a really nice skiing resort. But compared to this over here, I think nothing in the U.S. is overrun. Here, they... they slam as many slopes as possible on one single mountain um and very often it's 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 rocky funny it's rockier than the rocky mountains in utah um where very often you find the uh, trees all the way up uh, into the skiing resort and here you are above the, the tree line and then you have multiple runs and a lot of people and it's quite easy to get here so there are a lot of people who well, are very unfit have not been on skis for for ages and so often i'm when i'm skiing here i miss utah <laughs> yes, it's not a bad place to be <laughs> yeah nice talking of utah and a pla and a place to be how come that you live there Yeah, so I, we're actually, my wife and I are from Pennsylvania on the eastern part of the states. Which is not a neighboring state. <laughs> not at all, no, and not nearly the mountains or anything. It's just a very different place. And we both grew up not in the outdoors, uh, pretty conventional, like I played team sports in school and stuff. And then I don't really know how we kind of stumbled into, I think our first thing was like we did a backpacking trip to the Grand Canyon. And that's mm -hmm. probably the first time I ever slept in a tent. And we just fell in love with the outdoors. So we kind of got into backpacking and then from there I think it went to uh, rock climbing and then skiing and mountaineering we've done some high altitude stuff and so we've kind of been all over the world with it but like every time we went to the western states it just kind of felt like home to us even though it's not our it wasn't our home back then and mm -hmm. we had this dream of moving west and um, so we started just saving some money we both came from families where we didn't have a ton of financial security 
And like, so there's this like ski bum, um, dirt bag climber lifestyle that it's kind of glamorized, but like we knew what it was to be poor <laughs> and we didn't want to live our rest of our lives like that. Uh, but we also didn't think like, you know, you could become financially independent in your twenties or thirties or forties and just retire and whatever. So we were kind of just doing this hybrid thing where we were building up some security and then we were going to eventually move West and wing it. And we were very close to that in 2012. Didn't think we could have kids. And at that point we found out my wife was pregnant. And so we got really serious about like finance stuff. And that's when I went down this whole fire, financial independence, retire early path mm -hmm. and um, got, kind of got serious about it. And so eventually um, after five years of kind of planning and doing stuff, we did make the move and we've been in Utah since 2017. I guess 2018, we made the move. Well, and you are, or you were not getting rich by taking other people's money. So you didn't have a hedge fund or anything like this, but you worked as a? I was a physical therapist, yeah. And, physical uh, therapist. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know exactly the pay range for physical therapists in the US, but in, in, in Europe, at least in Germany, this is not one of the financially best regarded Uh, um, uh, jobs to work in so you were young you didn't bring any wealth from home neither did your wife she was pregnant uh, you worked as a physical therapist and you did four years of planning <laughs> and then you retired or, or what yeah so well, well first off to, like full disclosure to my wife also was working a very similar career. So like not, I, neither of us ever made a six figure salary in the States. So like topped mm -hmm. out around high 80, low $90,000 range. Uh, but what we did is, um, so we got married in 2001 and um, when we were getting out of school, um, so my family, um, my mom was really good at stretching a dollar and just being frugal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of had that kind of just pounded into me, like you don't do debt. <laughs> and then for my wife, she grew up with in a house where money was more of a struggle. And for her, just security was really valuable. So I said, like, we were planning for five years, but we've been saving for close to two decades. So what we did is when we got out of school, we started living off of her salary and every penny I made went to paying off her school loans and a car loan that she had from before we got married. because we really wanted to get married and be debt free. And we were kind of living that college lifestyle and we were pretty happy, you know, like you're, you're having fun when you're in college and you're young and you're dumb and you don't know any better. And so it was working. And so we just kept doing that and we rolled that into, okay, we're going to just use my money to my salary to save for a down payment on a house. And we kept living off her salary. And then we started investing my money. So for really 15 years, uh, we um, just saved my salary and lived off of her one salary and it worked for us. And in the process, um, We weren't super frugal because we had all this security because we were saving. So if we wanted to splurge, uh, even if you spend, you know, five or ten thousand dollars on a big trip, but you're saving the whole entirety of my physical therapy salary. Um, yeah, we were able to live a pretty nice lifestyle on the way. And we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't think you could actually retire early or become financially independent. That wasn't a concept that was even in our head. Uh, we were just saving because it felt good and we knew we were building up some security. And, and so we just kept going with it. When I, every once in a while, open up my Facebook, which I normally don't do more often than once a week by now, it's because it's always full of um, advertisement. Every second post is an advertisement. Sometimes somebody reposted or an article somebody reposted. And well, it's, 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 I, I don't feel it like it's about my friends. What I recognize though is that For some reason, I don't know what I'm normally searching for, um, but there, so often some so-called coaches tell me about retire early. And I don't even pay attention to that because it, 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 it feels to me like a scam. What does it mean to you when you talk about early retirement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I, well, these are two questions, by the way. Okay. What does okay. early mean and okay. what does retirement mean? Yeah, so when I first kind of, we, we started going down this path, like I said, we were just saving to have some security. We were going to kind of live that dirtbag, ski bum lifestyle, but with some security, just having some savings. Mm -hmm. I thought early retirement to me originally meant 
55, 60, maybe <laughs> like, like, I didn't think like retiring at 40 even made sense. Like it just didn't even register. And then I found these fire blogs and they were uh, kind of saying, you know, all you do, it's basically you turn life into a math equation. And if you say 50% of your salary, it takes you about 17 years to become financially independent. If you can bump that up to 70, you can be retired in like 10 years. If you save like the standard 15 to 20, which is recommended, it's going to take you about 40 years. And it was helpful to see that. Uh, but I think the problem when people start focusing on savings rate and retirement, it's like, I'm going to be happy when, so like if I just save and save and save and I can retire sooner and then I'm going to be happy when, and I think, so I mentioned like my wife and I, we had no idea what we were doing. And so we made a ton of mistakes, like with investing and tax planning, we had no idea what we were doing and it was costly mistakes, very costly. And we can dive into that if you want to, but the advantage of not knowing what we were doing is we were just living our lives. And like, we didn't have this goal of we're trying to retire at any certain time. So basically our limiting factor was vacation time and we were spending money to do the things we wanted to do. Like, so we were talking briefly before your call, like you have uh, for people that are listening to this, you have like these elephants from the Goro Goro crater in the background. Yeah. My mm -hmm. wife and I we were there. We went, we climbed Kilimanjaro. Then we did, um, we did uh, the Serengeti and the Goro Goro. And I think it was Lake, maybe Victoria. There was three places we went on uh, safari in, um, in Tanzania. And we've been to Australia and we've dove the Great Barrier Reef. We've done, climbed all throughout the mountain west of the States. We've been to Alaska. We've been through the, Carib the Caribbean. Um, so yeah, like it was never for us like this delayed gratification. It was just like our limiting factor was vacation time. We were kind of stuck in this. And, and in the States, I know sometimes like when we talk to Europeans, they're like, is that like an urban legend? Like it's only, you only get two weeks of vacation, but no, that's real. <laughs> and like we negotiated with our employer to get up to the point where we had four weeks off, at least I did. And, but that was kind of the max, like that was about pushing it as far as we could push our employers to go. And we just knew we wanted a lifestyle with more freedom. And so mm -hmm. that was what it was about for us. So, yeah, I think, um, I mean, we could have been financially independent a lot sooner if we would have applied some basic, just simple principles with investing and tax planning that we now know. But I don't know if we'd have been as happy, to be honest. Like, I think it was kind of almost a blessing to kind of stumble into this and, and learn to be happy while we were saving a lot of our money. What does happiness mean to you? Um, you know, it's evolving. I'm figuring that out. I, I would <laughs> love to say I had a great answer to, for you. Um, Damn it. <laughs> I thought I could copy paste that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like you asked me what retirement means. Like I really like, so I kind of thought like you either you're working or you're retired. I was caught in that dichotomy and, and I kind of bought into that when I started finding these fire blogs. And, and so I now blog at a site it's called, can I retire yet? And I literally was asking that question. That's how I found that blog. I didn't start it. It was started by um, my partner, Daryl Kirkpatrick, um, probably 10 years before I started writing. And I thought it was a great blog and I was reading it. But yeah, to me, that was the answer. I'm going to retire. Then I'm going to have all this free time. And what I found is, I mean, I've, I've achieved that. I don't work at all as a physical therapist anymore. But what I found is like having, having a lot of time, it's created a lot more opportunity to do the things I want. But like when you retire, you also give up a lot of things. So like one thing, like I mentioned, my wife and I, we value security and like you don't, it's just like, you don't um, probably, I guess it's possible to go on a crash diet and to like eat uh, 600 calories a day and lose all this weight. But it's for 99% of the people, it's not sustainable. And so we didn't do this because we were saving with this goal and living this extreme lifestyle. We were living it because it made us happy and it made us feel secure. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going to retirement and instead of having security of building up assets, now you're in theory spending them down. And like, it's terrifying for us. So like for us, like that was one thing we lost. Another thing as a physical therapist, I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people every day. And so in the States, like I hated our healthcare system. It's all this bureaucracy and there's all these things I hate. But I also, I was working with people one-on-one. -on -one. I was seeing them getting better. I was adding value to people's lives. And now all of a sudden you retire and like skiing is awesome. I love to do it. I could do it seven days a week, but I can't do it eight hours a day. <laughs> like mm -hmm. five of my legs just would tell me if like, it's too much. And so like, what are you going to do with the rest of that time? And so this idea that like, when you retire, you're going to be happy. I think it's a big myth and you have to find those things that are going to fulfill you. And so what, what, for me, what I've really found that I'm trying to work on is how do I take the best parts of work and how do I take the best parts of what I thought and merge that into this life that I don't want to retire from? And, and I'm still figuring that out. I'm, I'm working on it now. So does retirement mean having the freedom to do what you like? 
Yeah. So, I mean, to, to be fully transparent, like I'll, I'll write on the blog, retired at 41 and, you know, you're competing with like banks with million dollar budgets and stuff. So you have to have a little tagline and people say, well, you're not really retired because you're writing and this and that. So full disclosure, what my life looks like is I've written, since I've left my job, I've written a book. I write how on long the blog. Is that ago, how, how long ago did you um, leave the job? I left my job in December of 2017. Um, okay, I spent yeah. like the first year really working hard on the book. And that's also when we were moving across the country. And then since then, um, now we're kind of settled here and I still write my blog. So I publish like one article a week. So it's not, I would say I probably work. It just depends. And it depends what you're calling work. Like I enjoy these types of conversations, but I guess technically right now I am working because this is yeah. promotion. Um, but so like where is work and where is fun? It kind of blends together for me because I'm doing the stuff I like to do. But I would say I maybe between writing and reading and doing podcasts and things like that, I would maybe spend anywhere from 10 to 25 hours a week. Um, and I can pretty much have control over my schedule. And then I ski all day and do those types of things. I, I, I'm outside almost every day. I live right in the mountains. It butts up right to our house with, with the mountains. So that's what my life looks like. My wife still works part-time. She works about 28 hours a week. Uh, her, she works for a company out of Washington, DC. So it's on the other side of the country. Again, she has almost full control of her schedule. She has some meetings and clients, uh, but for the majority, she kind of schedules when she wants and kind of has a very similar lifestyle. And we make enough that we basically cover our expenses. So even though we're like, quote unquote, retired, we're actually not spending down. We're actually are, we're seeing our investments grow because we're not taking from them. And, but we have all this freedom. So if you want to say it's not retired, that's fine. Uh, but we're kind of finding the lifestyle that works for us. Um, again, having that security that we wanted, but also yeah. having that freedom that we wanted and, and, and figuring it out. And is it perfect? Absolutely not. Like we still, um, <laughs> we certainly are not without problems, but um, you know, we're, we're improving and we're getting better every day. And that's all I think you can ask for. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was asking because I, often I meet people who want to retire early or they don't put it that way. They say they want to become rich. Like I wanted to become rich so that after I became rich, I have the freedom to do whatever I want to do, which is some kind of retirement uh, because I don't have to work for the money. And um, at, at, at one point I sat down and I was like future pacing. I was really imagining living that life and doing what I love most. On the one hand, I it became quite difficult to understand or to put into words. What do I want to do if I could do whatever I wanted? And then if I put this, oh, I let my mind run through several weeks of this. Okay, what, what do you do when you're done? If you want to go and see Serengeti, well, it would be so cool to just go there for a week or two weeks or a month or a year, but at some point you're done. If it was for the curiosity and what's next. And then I thought, no, I, I want to do something. I want to interact with people. And yes, I, I don't mind getting paid for that because if, um, if, if, if you're just go giving it away for free, people sometimes they don't see the value in this. So for me, it was a bigger, a bigger struggle and When I talk to people now in the coaching situation, I ask them, what is it that you really want to do? So it's not about do something you don't, you, you hate <laughs> until you are either worn out or rich. Um, but um, what is it that you love to do? And then try to make money with that and downsize with everything else. Yeah, and because I, I've been, I, yeah. I was Go just ahead. gonna say, I've been talking to uh, readers of my blog Uh, I just kind of, it helps me to kind of get a sense of what people struggle with because the, the people that read my blog tend to be, again, it's called, can I retire yet? So they're tending to ask that question. Like they're at that stage where they're ready to make a change, but you know, you start to get fearful and you start to have these challenges. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions I ask every one of them is what you just said, like, what do you really want? Because I think a lot of people just start down this path is I want to retire because that's what you do. Like you either you're working or you're retired and it's like this and dichotomy. And so I ask them, what do you want? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then, but then the second question is, um, that I think is super valuable that I ask almost everybody is if you choose this, what are you giving up? Um, because nothing is free in life, right? So everything comes with trade-offs. And so if you're going to retire, 
in their traditional sense, like, yeah, you're going to have unlimited freedom. You can do whatever you want with your time, but now you lose those things that work provided. You lose the income, you lose maybe the sense of purpose. You lose, if you're a physician particularly, or people like that, that sense of identity, like they say, I am a doctor. And then all of a sudden you're not anymore. And so like, how's that going to feel? Like you have to think about these things. So I think it's really valuable to, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Like, what do you really want? Not what does society tell you you should have, but then also if you choose this, what does that mean you're giving up? And like, how can you maybe find ways to take baby steps to start making changes and try little things out before you dive into the deep end and realize, oh my goodness, I don't know how to swim. <laughs> uh, but yeah. like, how do I dip my toes in the water? And do I really want this? Do I really like this? How does this feel? Um, because a lot of times you don't know until you do it. And, and uh, that could be pretty intimidating and trap people. Mm. Now, let's imagine somebody's listening um, who is, li is living a, well, decent life. Um, so there's nothing that he, re that he or she really hates. Um, and it would be no problem to go on for another 10, 10 years or so. But, and I think that is a, a problem for many people in the mid 40s mid 40s 50s let's say let's say you're 50 you you were talking about early retirement and now 50 might might be even uh, late but um once you are approaching 50 you know maybe i'm going to work for another 10 or 15 years and then what for me retirement became a threat Like, well, then you are, then you are old. You're just waiting for death. <laughs> you, you, because very often re being uh, retired on a, on a, um, well, on a state pension or something like this doesn't, well, it doesn't make you rich. So all of a sudden you are sitting there with a low income and no security and no purpose anymore. Um, and so very often people say, well, I don't mind working another 10 or another 15 years, maybe they have kids at the moment, they say, okay, they have to go to school anyway. But then when the kids are out of, out of town, out of the house, then I want to have something else, something new, a new, a new chapter in my, in my book. And um, if they have said, in, if they have something in mind, maybe they want to start painting, maybe they want to go skiing, maybe whatever they want to do. What are the fundamental basics to save up for that time yeah so i mean for us like so i mentioned that my wife and i we saved one salary and lived off of one and how we did that i mean so there, there's two answers to that question i think uh, number one is if you're earning like minimum wage or you're earning a low salary um half of that savings equation is to earn more right because um like there's this like dirty secret like everybody says you have to be ultra frugal But yeah, if you're earning a super low salary and you want to save half of it, then you, yeah, you have to live on beans and rice or whatever. But like we lived really well because we were, while we were fixing our base costs, we were increasing our salary. Uh, so we were, we were doing well there and we weren't uh, suffering and sacrificing. So you have to earn enough and you have to focus on both sides, both the spending and the earning side. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is what a lot of people do is they start earning more money and immediately they go and spend it all. And so like, like I can give the example, like I graduated, I went to physical therapy school and I know like most people come out a good bit in debt already. And like I mentioned, like my wife and I, our first thing was to get all of our debt gone. That was just a priority. Why we thought differently. I don't know. Probably again, because my mom pounded that into my head and my wife, it was just a security thing from just having bad experiences of growing up without much money. But like, I can tell you like my roommate, my best friend from college, and this isn't like a judgment on him or anything, but just it's what he did. And that's what most people do. I know he went out and bought this like brand new, huge pickup truck. And he was so proud of it. And he brought it to my house. And I still remember that. And like another good friend, like she went out and she bought an Audi and like, like you said, physical therapists aren't making a lot of money, but you're going to take on a payment of five, $600 a month. And that's just an anchor that's weighing you down every month. And my wife and I, we made a different decision. We just drove old crappy cars because we didn't value that. Um, the other big expense is housing. Like for most people, you go out and you buy a house and at least in the States, how that works 
is you go to a realtor and he says, we're going to go to a bank and get pre-approved. That makes your offer stronger. So now they know what you can afford. And magically you get shown houses at the top of your limit of what you can afford. Instead of what we did, we said, this is what we want to spend. We want to live off one salary. And we went and we said, this is the houses we want to look at. And we made a conscious decision. Again, those are two mm -hmm. conscious decisions, uh, but housing and cars. So what are your biggest expenses for most people, at least in the States, it's housing, cars, food. And then after that, probably taxes. Um, so how can you minimize those biggest expenses? And then it gives you freedom to not be trying to optimize and spending a lot of mental energy on little things that really don't move the needle. Um, like if you're drowning and you need to cut out the lattes or not go out to eat or something, that might be what you need to do to get started. Um, but like, that was not our experience at all. We got the big things right. And then we just spent what we wanted. Like I said, we traveled the world. We went out to dinner. We went to sporting events. We went to concerts. We lived a great life because we got the big things right. And so spend less than you earn means both getting the big expenses and then also upping your earning. And by doing that, you can develop a high savings rate without sacrifice. And that's the key. But what about the good debt? What is good debt? <laughs> Well, you explain to me. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think good debt, if I would say we maybe It's lowering your taxes, we maybe uh, could have done better if we would have spread our mortgage out, but we just didn't like having a payment. Um, so if we were trying to optimize our finances, we could have carried our mortgage over 30 years. We paid our house off in seven because we just hated having debt. Um, School loans maybe can be okay debt because uh, it's going to allow you to earn more. But again, like we, my wife and I, again, we came from pretty modest backgrounds and we have between us six degrees with other than her bachelor's, we did it all without debt through a combination of working while we went to school, getting employers to reimburse us, getting scholarships, um, trying to think of any other strategies we used. Um, but yeah, I mean, we managed to do that. So yeah, I, I, I would say there can be debt that's not crushing, like credit card debt is crushing, car loans, you're taking out uh, something that you're paying interest on while it's depreciating, that's crushing. Uh, but I would challenge the idea of good debt. I mean, it's there's maybe let better me, debt. Let, yeah, let me, uh, uh, let me pick up on that. Let's imagine um, that you have, um, well, let's say 10,000 bucks that um, out of your pocket so you could spend them and it wouldn't hurt you and um, now you could pay for a car maybe an older car cash it's yours or you um, you finance the car so you have a what well, maybe only that 500 and you're investing that the rest of the money um yeah you're investing it you buy bitcoins <laughs> and hope hope for this uh, the prices to rise in the end you get uh, maybe 15000 back and um you can still afford the uh, the 500 a month for the car so that's this is what many people would regard as a good debt especially if it comes with zero which is often the case in Europe at the moment, or like 1% interest rate. It's like, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Um, so in the United States, uh, maybe a, a better example of in our culture is if you have a, a mortgage, I think right now mortgages are like 3% for 30 years, which is insanely low. Mm -hmm. And then like you say, well, you can invest for an average of eight or 10%, or if you want to do your Bitcoin example, <laughs> uh, but, but let's do the Bitcoin example what if Bitcoin drops by 70% and you lose your job and like that debt is still hanging over you. Um, so in an optimal scenario, yes, absolutely. Using good debt and leveraging that and you should work out better, but there's also just, there's just a freedom. You talked about what is happiness uh, in a lot of ways. It's that removing that mental burden. So for us, like we live in a house with a, it's a fully paid off house with no mortgage. So if my writing income goes away and my wife's income goes away and the stock market crashes, We could just go walk in the mountains. We have basically no expenses other than we have to feed ourselves, pay our property taxes and utilities. Uh, that's basically all we would have to pay. And, and we could still be happy. Wait until your your kids go to a university. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, I mean, but, uh, you know, you remove that that mental burden, I think, when yeah. that's hanging over you when you owe money to somebody. Um, so for me, that's priceless. Uh, but other people would disagree. And that's, I mean... That's the idea of freedom, right? You can choose to do whatever you want. And if you want to lever things up, but leverage is a two-way sword and, and you just have to understand that 
uh, if things drop and like, you know, it's Murphy's law, like thing, one thing doesn't tend to go bad. Things tend to go bad <laughs> at the same time, unfortunately. And so like, you know, that leverage can cut both ways. So um, mm -hmm. if you use it wisely, um, there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, but we really are big on risk management. Okay. So let's go back to the basic strategy. So mm -hmm. did I understand you right? You say, um, or you said, um, minimize, so be debt free. Um, and minimize your expenditure. And try to save half of your income. Yeah, so in, in my book, I kind of broke it down into there's three levers you can pull on. You can spend mm -hmm. less, you can earn more, and you can invest better. And that's really the only three things you can do. I don't think that there is one path. Like, so I would never tell anybody, you must avoid debt. That's your decision. I would never tell anybody, you know, you need to earn $200,000 a year or you need to start a business because not everybody's an entrepreneur. Not everybody has those particular skills. But somewhere in there, you have to find the right combination of, you know, if you want to really focus on the frugality and pull that lever really hard, then you don't have to worry about earning as much or investing as well. Or like, I don't think I'm excellent at anything. Like we earned above average salaries. Um, we lived relatively frugally because we got our big expenses right. Mm -hmm. And we just do basic index investing that's pretty vanilla and boring. And because we do everything <laughs> reasonably well, Uh, we've gotten to this point, like we're not rock star earners, we're not super frugal, and we're not, uh, you're not going to find like a super investing tips when talking to me. But if you just do everything well, then that's good enough. And so that was kind of the path we took. But there are people that they don't earn a lot of money. So maybe they invest in real estate, and they're using a lot of leverage to do that. Um, and that works for them. And that's fine. Um, there's people that are just high earners, they're physicians. And they want to live like a resident forever and they can save a couple hundred thousand dollars because they have a four hundred thousand dollar salary and a hundred and fifty thousand dollar lifestyle and that works for them and so all they really have to do is save and throw it into index funds and that works for them uh, it, you just have to kind of find the path that works for you and that's kind of the message of our book is we give a lot of examples and then you mm -hmm. pick and choose what works for you what do i do if i if i'm not good at choosing <laughs> um well uh, so what the, because where we The, the strategies, they were there before you. Mm -hmm. So let's say I could have read them somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I could have applied them 20 years ago. I did not. Mm -hmm. I just thought I need to earn more. Mm -hmm. What I did is I spent more. <laughs> the more I earned, the more I spent. And in the end, I owned a lot of shit that I couldn't enjoy because I was, well, working all of the time or worrying about the next payment. So I needed the next big paycheck to come in. Yeah, so I mentioned like in our book, there's three levers you could pull, right? Spend less, earn yeah. more, invest better. But in the book, there's five sections. So the first section is mindset. It's you have to change your mindset. And because I think a lot of people, they don't even think it's possible. And so they don't try, right? And so we really talk a lot about that of just realizing that there are people doing this. They're normal people. Uh, again, I'm not a genius. As you can tell from talking to me, I made a lot of mistakes on the way and I'm still figuring stuff out, but I still got here. So the first thing is just, you have to develop the mindset and you have to be willing to learn and be a lifelong learner. Uh, so that's the first thing. Then the spend what, less. What mindset? Let me, let's, let's, let's imagine me what what year is it 10 10 15 years ago so i thought it doesn't matter how much i earn the money is just going to disappear so i mean now you say change the mindset yeah how am i going to do that yeah so i mean i guess the the reason i share my story and i i feel the power of story is so valuable um, so I don't know if you're familiar, um, the example I heard recently, I've been using this a little bit, but are you familiar with Roger Bannister? Do you know who that is? No. Nope. So he was, I think it was like the late fifties, I believe I may be getting the dates wrong, but he was a runner 
And prior to Roger Bannister, there was this kind of like this limit. Everybody believed like the four minute mile for a human was impossible. Like you could not run it in less than four minutes. So Roger Bannister comes around and he ran it in like 358 or something like that. And he broke mm-hmm. the four minute mile, right? The, so what he did was he broke the impossible as if like he's some freak of nature or something that couldn't happen. Within six months, two other men broke that. Since then, over like 1,500 people have broke the four-minute mile. I think it's been broken by a 50-year-old. It's been broken in a high school meet. And so just by realizing, and I think this is the power of story and the things that we tell ourselves and the things that we believe, is by seeing the fact that other people are doing this and applying this and living a different lifestyle, uh, it shows that it's possible. That's not to say everybody's going to do what it takes, but I think it starts there is you have to know that it's possible and you have to truly believe it. Uh, because you have to, you have to take actions and it take, again, like my overnight success story of retiring at 41, it took 15 years of working and living off of one salary and, and investing and doing things consistently. And prior to that, it took seven years of going to school and developing these skills and being intentional about how we got our education without burying ourselves in debt. So like our overnight success story was 20 years. And so you have to be willing to, you know, believe that something is possible and then take action and to do it consistently. And, uh, and it's really hard. Like I kind of find when I'm talking about this, it's hard to not sound like arrogant because I don't know why the heck we, we chose to live something different because we didn't see that by anybody. And so I do think there was something somewhat special there with what we did, but I don't think there's anything particularly special about me like that, you know, that's not replicable other than that we just took action. And that's the key is you have to take action and it's hard to take action, though, if you don't believe it's possible. And so, yeah, you have to, uh, I, I think that's the power of story. How do you, how did you, well, yeah, I, I suppose I know the answer. I wanted to ask, how did you motivate yourself through these, well, 10 or 15 years of saving? Um, and I, I suppose it's because you enjoyed your life while living it. So you Absolutely. didn't wait for the end of being a physical therapist. So because you all you so you did fun stuff along the way. So you didn't suffer for 15 years. Um, what is your suggestion if somebody does suffer? So yeah, if you're so, working way too long, you come home absolutely tired. Um, you don't have the energy to do well fun stuff, and you feel like it's just not enough. Yeah, so I think um, the way this whole fire, financial independence, retire early was traditionally taught was you figure out your expenses, you get them as low as you can. Mm -hmm. You save till you have 25 times your expenses. And that's based on what's called the 4% rule, meaning you could take 4% of your portfolio and adjust it up a little bit for inflation every year. And you're financially independent forever. That was the way it was traditionally taught. And mathematically, there's nothing wrong with it. It works perfectly. But realistically, (laughs) um, a couple of things happen. Number one is to get people try to get their expenses as low as possible to manipulate those numbers and they make themselves miserable. And then the other thing is people that like myself, who aren't miserable, but they're saving. And then you get to that point where you have 25 times your spending, you save because you're a natural saver because it gives you comfort. It gives you security. Mm. And now you have to spend it down and it, it, it doesn't work. And so what I tell people is the concept is solid and start with that focus on your spending. Cause if you can get your core spending down and learn to be happy in the process, now you've developed a lifestyle where you have all this freedom and flexibility, but then along the way, you don't have to wait till you have 25 times just start gradually changing your lifestyle because you have freedom every step of the way. It's not like a dichotomy of, I have no power. I have no power. I have no power. Now I have 25 times. I have unlimited freedom. It's like you build freedom as you go. And so if you hate that job, change your job and go to something less pay- that pays less, but that you're happier with, because you have five years of freedom or 10 years of freedom of runway. And if, if things fail, you're not going to lose your house. You're not going to lose your car. Um, you're not going to be hungry. Um, so use that security. And, and that's really, that was in our book. Again, uh, that was the first chapter of the book. And um, somebody, again, this book was all just based on people that we're all kind of figuring this out together. And he called it the stages of financial independence. And I thought that was a neat concept, but it wasn't earth shattering to me. And it was kind of buried somewhere in like chapter 17. <laughs> and our editor got the book and she said, 
this is amazing. This is the book. This is what makes what you guys are talking about different. This needs to be its own chapter and it needs to be chapter one. And I took her advice, luckily, and I think it made the book much better. And I think people latched onto that and it's helpful. But yeah, I think the key is you don't view it as that dichotomy and that you don't view retirement as this time when you're going to be happy, but you're building freedom and you take advantage of that on the path. And I think that's the key. What do you think about uh, getting a, a partner on board? So that could be a friend, that could be a financial advisor, that could, you, that could be your spouse or, or, or your, the partner you're living with or whatever. What I figured out is that, um, that well, <laughs> the easiest person to trick for me is myself because, well, I do that tomorrow. And um, I see this very often in the coaches that well, they consciously, they figured it out. They somehow made a decision, but they don't stick to this because the habits that they built up over the last life <laughs> is, um, well, pulling them into the old structures again. And um, I find it very helpful if, you're sitting together with somebody who's keeping you accountable for that. For example, if you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I minimize my, my spendings and I want to give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, I know that my, um, my parents, when they bought their house, um, they, they, they made a test run for one year. So, and they just, went down with all the ex, um, expenses that, as much as they could. And they lived as if they were putting the money already in the house. And then they knew that they can do it. They had saved a bit of money so that the down payment and then they, because they wanted to get rid as fast as possible with the, uh, with, with the payment as well. And for they had a, a bigger self-discipline, like maybe me. Mm -hmm. um, I have somebody specific in mind <laughs> um, who, if, if you talk to her, she agrees and she has, she has a very good paying job. So she never needs to worry about the money. And if you explain to her that concept, it makes sense, but she doesn't do it day in, day out. So for her, it helps to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm just, The moment I receive my money, I'm giving a chunk away and somebody else takes care of it. And, and I just lived the life like I used to, just with a smaller paycheck because a part of it is going away. Do you think to be... To be successful and lasting successful, you need to do it on your own? Or... Do you think it's okay if you are giving it away to somebody? Um, you're talking like an advisor, like a paid financial advisor? Whatever. Your parents, your spouse, a friend, a partner, a financial advisor you pay for, whatever. Just in general, all of these scenarios have in common that people are not taking care of their own financial situation. And all these four or five cases that I just mentioned, they, they are giving it away to somebody else. So they don't, they don't have to deal with it on a daily basis. Do you think that can work or do you need, does it need to come from the inside out? I think it's challenging if you try to outsource those things. Um, I think that everybody needs help at some point. Like I am not an expert at everything. I use a, a accountant because I'm very interested, but even I, like as much interest as I have and as much as I read, I'm not up on every tax law and it's worth it to me to pay for accounting advice once a year when I have to fi file my taxes mm -hmm. and probably once earlier in the year to plan ahead. It's like we don't wait till the last minute. Um, but I think a lot of things people think are hard are really not very hard. Um, being an investor, um, the things that you read in the media is mostly just noise and the better you are at ignoring it and the better you are at not even being aware of it, the mm -hmm. better investor you're going to be because you're going to have that long-term focus. Um, like I can tell you, like you mentioned Bitcoin, like I know that everywhere you look now, like people are talking about cryptocurrency. Yeah. 
Is that going to be the next big thing? It might be, but I can tell you this, I have zero. Uh, I have zero money and zero dollars in any cryptocurrency um, because I can afford to miss out if, if that is the next big thing. Uh, I'm just not worried about it. Um, like the, you'll see like is like in the States at least like the big talk is like Amazon is becoming so huge and Tesla is like going up and up and down and then back up. And like, again, I own them because I own index funds that own everything and I just ignore it and I live my life and I, and I don't worry about it. Um, so I think like a lot of stuff that people think is hard and they think you need somebody to tell you, nobody knows the answers. Like nobody, maybe Bitcoin is going to be the next big thing. Maybe this company is going to be the next big, the next, you know, Amazon or the next Tesla or whatever, but maybe they're not. And like, if somebody really knew the answer, like, and you have $50,000 in your investments, do you think they're going to come and need to have your money? They're going to be <laughs> managing some billion dollar fund. Like, so the people that you could get that advice from are not going to be out there looking for you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think like you really need to simplify finances as much as possible and take control. And then if you have specific questions, yeah, then get a little bit of help here and there, but yeah, you have to, you have to take control of your finances and you have to be knowledgeable, at least a base level of knowledge, and then just look for a little bit of help where you need it. I, I think that you, answered your question. Yeah, well, it's, it's helping. What do you mean by simplifying your finances? Yeah, so again- like, Dollar is a dollar. How do you simplify it? Well, I mean, again, so what matters, right? So we said you can spend less, right? And there's a gazillion things out there. There's whole sites dedicated to couponing. I've never clipped. I mean, I, I probably have clipped a coupon in my life, but I, it's not a focus of my life. Um, like there's, there's this whole thing of like the latte factor. Like if you cut out a latte, that's $5 and you save it every day. And then you look at, if it compounds at 8% in 50 years, you're going to have $500,000. I could care less. Like if I want coffee, I go get coffee. Um, so simplifying means what are the things that really move the needle? So again, housing, cars, your food that's recurring. It's something you have to think about, but it's recurring. Um, taxes, once you can start saving and using tax advantage accounts, and then you're investing. Like, like you mentioned, if you're paying somebody and they're taking 1% of your wealth, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're getting 10% returns a year, and that's if you're fortunate, if you can get that every year, they're taking 10% of your growth. And if you're getting 5% growth, which is probably more realistic in this environment, they're taking 20% of your growth if they're taking 1% of your wealth. So you have to really understand the math of of those things. So if you get those things right, you're going to spend a lot less without ever thinking about your finances. So again, housing, cars, food, taxes, investments. If you cut, if you control your expenses in those areas, you really never have to think about it. You just put it on autopilot and you never think about it again. Um, earning more. Uh, again, I think a lot of people have misconceptions about what it takes. So, you know, if you can, do you want to go the career path and go to college or something? That's fine, but you have to look at college as an investment, right? So how do you get the skills you need, whether it's a degree, whether it's a trade, whatever, how do you get the most skills that's going to allow you to earn more for the least amount of money? Again, looking at it as an investment. So that's the big thing there. Building a network is a big thing. If you're going to look to earn more, like, like you have to know people and you have to have connections to get places. And so building a network is a really big thing. So what are the couple of key things? And then once you're in a career, how do you manage your career? How do you get those raises when you need them? So those are the things we highlight. And then investing, mm -hmm. um, you have to match your investing with the path that makes sense for you. So again, if you have a big savings rate, you can take an approach like I have where you really don't care about your investments. You put them in passive index funds. Over time, history tells you that they should grow at a certain rate that's gonna be fine. But if you don't have, if you don't have the ability to save one salary, or if you have a very small salary, and, and so even if you save a good bit as a percent, it's not going to build up to where you can live off of that, then maybe you have to use a different approach. So maybe you invest in a business, a personal business that allows you to earn more. And, and you know, eventually that becomes more of a lifestyle thing as you source some things out, or you invest in real estate where you're, you are using some leverage, uh, but you have to do that wisely and carefully and know that that comes with unique risks. Uh, but you have to find the investment path that works for you. So those are the big levers you can pull. And then within those levers, those are the kind of the paths you can take. And so that's how you simplify is that you choose the right things for you. And then you put as things on autopilot as much as you can and you go live your life. Well, this is what I, this is what I like about you. <laughs> you don't say it's super easy and you do just do these three things and you are going to be rich in three years <laughs> and you own a, an, an island in the Caribbean. Um, um, if, well, I didn't on purpose, I didn't go into any text questions because I know that they are very US specific. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I mean, even for Europe, it's not 
like one tax. It's right. 27 only for the European Union. So it's getting quite, uh, quite complicated. And um, if somebody wants to be in charge of their own finances, knowing the taxes is one part of the equation. If somebody, if somebody liked what you said, um, what is the name of the book? Oh, so our book probably is called, on Amazon, right? <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, you can buy the book anywhere. It's called Choose FI, Your Blueprint to Financial Independence is the name of the book. Yeah, say that again. Choose FI, Your Blueprint Choose to Financial Independence. Yep, and FI is Financial Independence. So it's Choose FI, Your Blueprint mm -hmm. to Financial Independence. By Chris Mamula. Yep. Mamula. Yep. Yeah, and then I, I have two co-authors and it's based on, they do a podcast where they talk to a bunch of people who have done something mm -hmm. similar to what I've done and they've both done it. And then they talk to a bunch of people. And again, we just take lessons. So you pick and choose. Again, we, we yeah. don't have that formula, like follow 10 steps, which I know a lot of people like because it's easy and they don't have to put much thought into it. But and it it's also, easy to miss. <laughs> right. It also takes you to one destination, which may not be where you want to go. So yeah. Our book is purposefully, it's kind of a choose your own adventure and you kind of pick and choose the levers you want to pull that makes sense for your life. Okay, very cool. Um, I link, um, I put a link to the book in the show notes and um, where is the easiest way to find you? Yeah, so my home on the internet, I write at the blog, can I retire yet? And it's can I retire yet .com. And okay. uh, I have a contact form on there. And I also, we have, we allow comments and I'm very responsive. I'm, if you send anything through the blog, it'll come to me. Yeah, perfect. I will link. I will link that in the show notes as well. And um, what is uh, what is your goal for, for in ten years, twenty thirty one? That's a great question. And and honestly, I, I I don't have a great answer for it. Um, I think like when you start listening to like the whole fire and retire early, what everybody says is you should have something that you shouldn't be retiring away. Like you're escaping, you should retire to something. And I think in general, that's good advice. Um, so I left my job on Friday, December 1st of 2017 on December 4th, I started writing my book on January 1st of the next year. I started on this blog. I was writing a, a little blog. I never monetized it, never did anything with it. Um, six months later, we moved across the country. So in between there, we were packing our house, selling, selling all of our possessions, doing all that stuff and then resettling. And I took on a bit too much too soon. So I'm kind of like now like <sighs> taking a deep breath and kind of figuring out what is next for me. And, and it's not an easy answer. Uh, so yeah, I'm still figuring that out. Something that you want to do? Um, so I, I have an eight-year-old daughter. Um, so the next 10 years, I mean, I really want to focus on being the best dad I can. Um, I'm really focusing on um, just being a big part of her life. Um, my wife and I, like I mentioned, we're really into the outdoors. We're mm -hmm. skiers, climbers, hikers, mountaineers. Um, so we are, um, while we're young and healthy, I'm trying to do as much of that as I can and then just enjoy life. Um, a big family project we have, it's, it's pretty um, obscure and goofy, I think, but uh, we're trying to get to the highest point in all 50 states, which uh, uh, after this summer, hopefully we'll be to have, thir we'll have been to 30 of them. And those range from like, uh, some of them are, couple hundred feet above sea level, like in the state of Florida, uh, where you're in a park and you walk in your flip-flops. And the highest is Denali in Alaska, which I, I mentioned, we've done some high altitude mountaineering. So my goal is if we don't uh, turn our daughter off on this idea, by the time she graduates high school, we'll still be like in our early mid fifties. And hopefully we'll still be able to do a, a major mountaineering objective like that. So uh, that's kind of a, a fun project that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I believe I believe it is. The Denali is, um, I think, quite difficult. Yeah, you have to give yourself. Uh, general, I mean, you could probably do it in five days if you had a great weather window. But mm -hmm. people generally take like two to three weeks because you can get holed up in a in a storm and and get stuck on a glacier for a while. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's a legit mountaineering objective. Cool. And what is a one great outdoor worldwide that you haven't seen yet? and still planning to do? Uh, well, you know, like, um, so two, like, so I mentioned we got into high altitude mountaineering and Denali. So that's kind of how this whole goofy high pointing thing came about. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to my wife getting pregnant, that was our next big mountain. So we've done, uh, we've been to Kilimanjaro. Uh, that's what originally took us to Africa as we were talking about. Uh, we've done some uh, volcanoes in Ecuador and in Mexico and Denali was big on my list. 
And we're also looking, there's a big mountaineering objective. Um, it's called uh, Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier in Washington state in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we were, those are our two next objectives, the things we were working towards. And then um, when we were going to do um, Liberty Ridge, our partner who was kind of the more experienced mountaineer of us, he, his uh, girlfriend got pregnant and she was due like the week we were going to do our trip. So we bailed on that. And then the next year my wife <laughs> got pregnant and we kind of fallen off of that. But yeah, those two are, are high on my list that I would love to eventually one day do if we can if we can get there. Yeah. Nice. Nice. If you ever, if you ever want to go, uh, uh, do some climbing in Africa, uh, uh let me, let me know. Um, when I'm doing these, uh, Kilimanjaro tours, um, about, uh, well, I, I didn't do anything last year, but, um, I think I'm going on the Kilimanjaro again with a group next year. Um, and um, we are organizing tours uh, every once in a while for Ethiopia for the Simeon Mountains, which is a very nice training for high altitude because, well, it's not snow covered. Um, it's quite easy tracks. It's magnificent. And you are between 3,000 and 4,500 meters all of the time. I mean, you are sleeping on 3,000 if you're down in the valley. Um, and there is um, there are some really nice um, there's a really nice mountain range I think uh, it's between Uganda and the and the Republic of Congo, Virunga and it has a couple of um, well peaks that are around 5,000 meters and it's in the middle of the jungle in Africa so well when you're ready for that <laughs> let me know. And I don't think you'll mind me doing this, but if I could kind of give a plug for like why people should do that, like when we went to Africa, it was just, it was, it was just a life changing experience. Like we've been, like I mentioned, we've got into scuba diving, we've been to the Caribbean mm -hmm. and I thought we saw poverty and going there and just kind of seeing um, the poverty, but also the people's spirit when they live in that. And uh, like, I know, like we, like, I know when we were signing up, like we envisioned ourselves as being like pretty Uh, independent and self-sufficient and like so when we found out we had to take a team of like seven porters to hike up Kilimanjaro which is not a big technical mountain by any means we were just like what is this and but like getting to know the porters and getting to interact it was just it was probably the highlight of my one of I mean I have a daughter so seeing her born was probably the highlight of my life but uh, it was up there I mean it was it was just life-changing and uh, just meeting the people and and experiencing that And I could not uh, recommend it higher if you can get to a place like that and experience it yeah. for yourself. It, it's it's impactful. Yeah, and, and the fun and the laughter all of the time. I can I could by now if uh, if somebody wanted to do the uh, Kilimanjaro by themselves. Um, there are some regulations um, on how many people you have to take, but um we could even i mean if there are any uh mountain climbers out there we could put together a team where you're basically going self-sustained up there so you're carrying all of your own stuff you just need to have a minimum of people um and um we can organize the uh the crater summit which is um really tricky because you are approaching on a different site um, and uh, you have to go in the middle of the night when it's frozen because there are a lot of rock, rock falls and then you're sleeping in the crater. And then you're going um, from the inside to the, uh, to the top of the mountain. <laughs> so um, I didn't do that. It was planned for uh, October 2020, which for some reason <laughs> didn't work out. Great timing there. <laughs> But uh, maybe in the future. Chris, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, thank you for, well, your, your uncomplicated honesty. I think that's very refreshing um, to talk about this. Well, for many people, it's an annoying topic. Like happiness is doing what you love, not planning the money. <laughs> But um, uh, very often it is super helpful to get this out of the way so that you have brain capacity and, and visions for something else. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I found your approach very refreshing. Thank you for your time. I appreciate talking. I appreciate your open-mindedness. I know you're kind of skeptical and, and those are the conversations I like to have because I think this is the whole fire idea it tends to be presented in an extreme way and I think uh, it's much more achievable than people uh, think when they when you really yeah. understand what it actually takes.
yeah, one one um, one last thing that I want to point out because you said it uh, several times. You said everything comes with a price, and this is something that I realized a while back when I wanted to make more money on something I was already doing, and I was I thought I, I just have to copy somebody who's already successful. And when I did this in depth, I found out I don't want that. Yes, I want the fame and I want the success and I want the money, but the kind of determination, the kind of work that that person put in is something I don't want to do. I want to live my life different. And I realized after that, I coached some people that were so much richer than me and from the outside they look so successful and from the inside they're just human beings it's a choice you make so is happiness and so is financial freedom absolutely well said <laughs> having said this goodbye utah and um, enjoy your day chris absolutely you too and thanks for having me it's been a pleasure